is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 195 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Holy shit, we are just five episodes from 200. I, I actually can't believe that. It, it feels like it's gone in the blink of an eye. 200 episodes. What? I mean, obviously not right now. It's 195, but still, we're basically there. Uh, if you have any ideas about what you think I should do to celebrate, please let me know. I know my patrons have been asking me to do something, uh, so I ought to do something. I'm just not sure what. Um, and, uh, you know, so I will just bumble along continuing to do it. But uh, yeah, I really feel like this is a momentous uh, point. So I should probably do something to celebrate. Anyway, to today's episode, which is with Morgana Best. And we are talking all about how to sell direct. First to last week's question, which is, what are you reading right now? Mona Marple said, this was a great episode. And I'm reading Mumfluenced about mummy influence culture. Oh, interesting. And then uh, Lieber Blumenkrantz uh, said, lol, I'm actually... <laughs> I'm actually reading A Game of Hearts and Heights. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, I hope you found it uh, ex ex thrilling and spicy. <laughs> uh, okay, so this week's question is, are you on track? Are you on track? Are you on track with your goals this year? Are you on track with your reading goals, your writing goals? Are you on track to personal goals? How are you doing? Like, really, how are you doing? Tell me how you're doing. Okay. The book recommendation of the week this week is, don't hate me, but it is A Game of Romance and Rowan by my alternate ego, Ruby Row. The reason for that is because it's launch week. So as I record this, we're a week out, but uh, when this airs, it will be the 21st of uh, May, May, June. <laughs> Fuck, time is a lie. It will be the 21st of June. Oh, it'll be summer solstice time. Anyway, happy solstice, everyone. But it will be the day before launch. So Hearts and Heart, um, Romance and Ruin launches tomorrow <laughs> in real time on June the 22nd. So if you like spicy romance, but well, spicy fantasy romance, and you like second chance romance stories, uh, revenge, found family, then and now like plot lines, opposites attract, double agents, then this is the story for you. And to celebrate the launch of A Game of Romance and Ruin, I am going to be discounting A Game of Hearts and Heist. So it might not be until, it might. if you're listening to this in real time, it might not be today on Wednesday, uh, but it will be before the end of the week because I have a book bub. So uh, by by, by the weekend, uh, Game of Hearts and Heist will be on uh, sale. So make sure you go and grab a copy. It will be 99p. Uh, it's the first time it's been on sale. I don't know when it will be on sale again. I don't really do sales that often. So uh, if you have been putting off getting it, but you're curious and you want to have a nosy, now's the time. So yeah, go and get that. And to celebrate uh, Romance and Ruin uh, launch, uh, Chloe and I are going to be in London for the day. So that's going to be super exciting. An odd one for me this time because I haven't had uh, one, the energy, but also uh, like logically, it didn't feel right to have as big a launch and put as much into it as book one because one, I'm already working on book three, but also it's not a book one anymore. And so that's been quite unusual for me because each book for nonfiction is a book in its own right. And although these are inter interconnected standalones, they still have that series feel in a way. And it's been so long since I was launching a series, you know, in rapid, well, rapid-ish succession that it's been a bit of a head fuck for me to you know, try and tell myself that it's okay not to do all of the things. I don't need to do all of the things. I'm going to do that for the book that I write in September, which is then a book one in a new series. And, and, but still it's been hard to not feel like I'm failing because I'm not doing everything. You know, there is only so much time. And as I'm transitioning into doing considerably less freelance, I'm still doing stuff right now. I'm still trying to write the next book, you know, be a wife, do the podcast, do all of the things. And so it's been quite hard because part of me has been like, you should be pushing this more, you should be pushing this more. But actually, 
you know, you have to do some launches big and some small. Otherwise, you just lose your mind with trying to do all of everything all of the time. And you can't. You literally can't. So, yeah, I'm hoping that this one stands on its own, you know, enough that um, I don't have to do insane launches for every single uh, book. I'm really proud of this book because it was it was tricky. I had the full start in January. I wrote the 30,000 words, which I then eventually binned. And so, yeah, it, it like I was worried that I wouldn't get to the end of this book. I don't know about you guys, but every so often I'll get to the point that I'll finish a book and then I'll be like, well, that's it. That's it. I'm all out. I'll never be able to write another book. And of course, it's all utter bullshit. But you do have these like moments of doubt and imposter syndrome. And working with this new editor that I worked with oh my god this is like the best editor I've worked with in ages and it really brought me back to like that first developmental edit that I ever had and how excited I was to be able to see the progress and the growth and I'm really really fucking proud of this book I'm really excited by like the structural changes that she got me to do like the then and now stories and I don't know like I just I ha I just am proud. I'm just proud of this book. I'm I'm really happy given the start that it had, how it ended up. And yeah, like I, I don't know. I just it was fun in the end. And I, like I'm still having so much fun. Like I'm having fun writing this next one. And I'm excited about the new series. Like I've already started inputting and like binge reading and binge watching uh stuff. And I'm going to do something different. Like I'm excited to have the freedom to be able to do something different. Like don't get me wrong it's still gonna be spicy it's still gonna be fantasy but like the style's gonna be a bit different and like I'm excited to try that like I'm well I'm also excited to finish book three but like I don't know it's just so fucking pleasurable to be excited about the stuff that I'm writing and to be able to to do that every day so like I'm just so full of gratitude for the position that I'm in now so yeah I just but also I wanted to be real with you and and tell you that <laughs> You know, it, I, I was doubtful at one point, you know, because it was hard at the beginning of this book. I thought I'd fucked it. I wasn't going to be able to finish it. But then I did. So I won. <laughs> oh, look at me even getting giddy, even talking about winning. Anyway, <laughs> tell me your number one competition without telling me your number one competition. Anyway, the links to book two will be in the show notes and in fact I'm going to put the link to book one because it's on discount I'm going to put the link to book two which will be out tomorrow as I speak of course the, the paperback and the hardback are also live and uh book three now has a title a game of deceit and Desi desire and that will that pre-order is up now too so only the digital pre-order at the moment but that is now live as well so if you are a reader of the series then you can pre-order book three at the moment i'm putting it up for pre-order in january but um i would like to have it published <laughs> considerably sooner than that but you know life so I always put the pre-orders out really far and then I pull them back in so I am working on that book I'm over 20 odd thousand words in and um had a little bit of a full start this week because uh, my sister came to stay over the weekend and then her flight got cancelled because of all the storms in the UK so she stayed with us for another two days so I've lost two days of writing but fear not, we're going to adapt, we're going to pivot. Uh, I will work the weekend in order to get my word count in. And actually, today is a non-writing day and I'm going to try and get a couple of thousand words in today as well uh, uh, because that will lower the amount of pressure on the weekends. So yeah, like I feel so much more resilient than normal because I'll be honest, like I do not cope well with change and I don't cope well with having to adapt to stuff, uh, says like the number 30 something adaptability. But basically like the deadline for this is non-negotiable it is the 30th of june and i do have to hit that for the first draft so there is no time to like have an emotional breakdown which is what <laughs> which is what i would have normally done if i got my schedule knocked um and so i just feel it feel like an, i'm in a healthier mental place to be able to go okay fine so how do we get the words because we have to get the fucking words so yeah i'm just going to get them over the next two weekends and you know if i only get 2000 on that saturday a thousand on sunday you know another 2000 the following week then that's what i'm gonna have to do and that's okay i can do that i can i can adapt and change she says so even though she's not adaptable but anyway 
So the point is, I, I'm okay. I'm not panicking. I know I can get the word in. I know the, my pace. I know how I write. I just need to make the time to make that happen. And I am fucking loving book three because it's a competition. So like, obviously it's super fun to write. But anyway, we're talking about book two and I have waffled on long enough. So I think I'm going to move on. Rebel of the week this week is Karen Heenan. Okay, so Karen says, this story is set in the 1950s and the rebels are my parents. More my dad than my mum. She was a rebel from birth until the day she died. I still follow her lesson that the words, don't do that, should always be answered with, watch me. Mum married young and for the wrong reasons. She was 17 and bored and thought marriage meant regular sex and not worrying about money. Then her husband joined the army and was sent to Korea for three years and she lost the sex and had to get a waitress job to make ends meet. My dad was a regular at the diner where she worked. He was 40. He had a steady job as a firefighter and as the youngest of 12, whoa, was taking care of his aging parents while his siblings married and made lots of babies. The whole family was devoutly Catholic. While dad had dated, he'd never married. He was not prepared for the force of nature that was my mum. He didn't know what hit him. Six months after they met, her husband came home and she filed for divorce. She picked up her divorce degree and applied for a marriage license on the same day with the same clerk. (laughs) The marriage was very happy. She was the centre of his universe and liked it that way. That when Then the church got involved. The parish priest showed up one night at their apartment and told my dad he was living in sin with a divorced woman. What? Called my mum a few choice names and said that any child of the marriage would be born into, sin, into a sinful union and would be damned. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I want to say so many things. Now, dad was the kindest man I know. And yet, perhaps because he was 40 and had a 20-year-old in his bed and regular sex for the first time, he picked up the the judgy father and chucked him down the front steps. (laughs) Never to return. Dad remained Catholic for the rest of his life. His religion was a comfort during the period with his uh, job but I don't think it was ever the same after that and he never regretted his choice mum made sure of it oh my goodness me I fucking love that (laughs) like not that I necessarily condone violence but he was being a judgy prick and you know like good on your dad for looking out for his wife like good for him for standing up for her If you would like to be a Rebel of the Week, please do send in your story. We are always in need and we are still low. So if you do have a Rebel story or a parental Rebel story or a Rebel Nan story, then you can email them to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. Welcome and thank you to two new patrons, Danita Rambo, awesome name, and Angelica Anderson. Thank you both so, so, so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And of course, a gigantic thank you to all of my existing patrons. If you would like to this to support the show and get early access to all of the episodes as well as bonus content like the Slack community, the Rebel Masterclasses, Poison and Prose and the Movie Nights, then you can from as little as $2 a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. This episode is sponsored by Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors and their team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help you reach new readers around the world. Right now, digital books are reaching more people than ever and libraries are becoming an integral part of that. In 2021, top digital library systems powered by Overdrive loaned 500 million books, an increase of 16% on 2020. That's half a billion book loans, which means a lot of happy library readers. You can easily reach library readers through Kobo Writing Life. All you need to do is go to the rights and distribution section of your book, click yes to Overdrive and enter a library price. Your book will then be available to librarians to purchase for multi-loan use, but also for a one-time checkout option. 
Distributing with KWL means you're not paying any aggregator fee and you'll earn 50% on every library sale. If you're interested in taking part in library promotions, email KWL's dedicated author care team at writinglife at kobo.com and they'll add you to their mailing list. And don't forget to tell your readers that they can now pick up your book in libraries. If you want to learn more about KWL, check out the Kobo Writing Life podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts, and find them on social. Create your free account today at kobo.com forward slash writing life. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author podcast. Today, I am joined by Morgana Best. Morgana is a USA Today bestselling author. She started selling print direct in 1993 and ebooks as well as print direct from her websites in 2003. In 2007, indie authors turned to the retailers, but now the tide is turning back to selling direct. And you also have a book, which I have read, um, and it's Stop Making Others Rich, isn't it? That's the title. I always forget because I, 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 in my head, it's the Selling Direct book. Oh, good. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm terrible with uh, book titles, which is why, funny enough, my bookcase behind me is in colour code order because I don't remember what what the titles are. I just know what's on the cover. So I know your book is white and red. So that's it. That, that's how I find your book. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, I know. Anyway, hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you so much for having me. Um, before we dive into kind of the content of like, how do you sell direct? How do you sell literally from your website would you like to tell everyone a little bit about you and your journey like how did you get to where you are and and I suppose wrapped into that like what what guided you to choose selling direct from such an early point in your career well what I was actually an academic and Transworld Double Day Random House solicited my doctoral thesis and they thought it would make like an exciting coffee table book or some weird thing like that. And the the process went on and on and on and took so long that I got frustrated. And in the end, it fell through. And I already had the completed manuscript by then. So I thought, well, what am I going to do? Because they'd solicited me and I thought, I don't know what to do if I get an agent, what will happen? What am I going to do? So I thought, look, I'll just do it myself. And back then, It was called self-publishing, not being an indie author, and it was so looked down upon, particularly in Australia, where it still isn't a very good scene. And it was really quite dreadful. So I didn't know what I was doing. I went to a local printer and said, do you print books? And they ended up charging me 10 times more than the quote, and they had super high-quality paper, like it was crazy high-quality. It was just everything went wrong. The bindings fell out. <laughs> Everything went wrong. But that got me into, into it. And I'd always loved books. I was always very passionate about literature and books. And I always loved the business side of things. I always, even now, I always prefer admin and all that side of things, marketing. I'd rather do that any day than write, even though really? I love writing. Oh, yes, absolutely. (laughs) Oh, that's so interesting. Can I just ask, what was your academic background? Like what kind of field of study were you in? Um, I have to actually keep that on the down low because there are people who are still after me. (laughs) It was a controversial subject. (laughs) Okay, no worries, no worries. Um, So, yeah, so you, you, you continued down the rabbit hole of self-publishing despite the things that had gone wrong. Yes. Then, of course, being an overachiever, I had to get it right. And then I actually had another book out, which someone tried to, a big famous person in America tried to buy to shut down because it went against their ideologies. And so that's when I learned all about provisioning the buying of a, a book to shut it down. So I thought, okay, I really have to be independent. If I want to put out content, I can't take risks like having it in someone else's hands. And I had an agent at the time and I had to pay him off to get rid of him. It was a bit acrimonious. He didn't want to leave. (laughs) And so like I've had all this experience and then around 1993 when the internet got to Australia, I started websites then. So 
I had I was in a couple of different subjects. So I had two different websites and I sold print. But then after a while, I also sold ebooks, which back then were PDFs. And everyone, like everyone, some people were selling from ebooks from their site, and you could sell ebooks through eBay back then, and um, also through ClickBank. So I was selling them through all these outlooks. And then when just about around the time I joined up with Book Surge, and then Amazon bought book surge and changed the name to create space and took my books across so I was with create space right at the beginning selling and then I started obviously with Kindle and Smashwords was an early player I got with Smashwords and then all the others as they came up and then I started to get away from selling direct but then I went back to selling to focus directly on selling direct which was my first love really after a while, I had a few strange experiences and I thought, okay, you know, like the usual thing, a book gets pulled for no reason when it's ranking really high in its day of release, sits there for a, a week. By the time they put it back on sale, you've lost all your rankings. That's the end of your series. That t- I had a few things like that and I thought, yeah. no, I've got to go back to selling direct, focus more on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had a book not get a sales rank for like five days, despite the fact. Oh. So and then by the time that you've got the sales rank, all this, all, all like the sales of all the pre-orders that have come in <clears throat> don't matter because it's so far past where they've been recorded that, you know, the, the rank is irrelevant now anyway. Um, yeah. cool. And I think there is a real driver towards like the independent aspect of being an indie author now I think a lot of us took for granted that selling through these big sites meant that we were independent when in reality we are just like you know at the whims and fancies of of these big stores unless you are selling direct and I think we've 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 seen a movement towards selling direct more and more in the last few years, but I really think in the last six months, there's been kind of a shift and everybody's going, oh, you know, I think actually maybe I need to to, to sell direct. So, so let's talk about that. And let's start at the beginning. Like what are the first steps an author should take if they want to start selling their books directly from their website? Well, first of all, think of their objectives And that can be difficult because obviously things could change over time. So think of their objectives. Do they want to have an e-commerce business and run a business? How do they feel about marketing and admin? If they absolutely hate it, then I wouldn't suggest selling direct. I would say from a web, from a store, I'd only suggest doing it from a website, having some buy buttons and only doing it that way. It's a little bit of extra income. And then down the track, if they decide they want to have an e-commerce business, they can go ahead and do that. Otherwise, Shopify, you can't go past Shopify. Tesla's in Shopify, all the Kardashians. It's because it's by far the best if you want an e-commerce business. And you've got selling on selling on the retailers and you've got selling direct and they're nothing alike. They're completely different. It's not just a matter of you know, putting some buy buttons on your site and selling. It's being an e-commerce business owner. And I always bring up the sheep analogy and I always think, can only Aussies and New Zealanders understand this analogy? But if think of a farmer and a sheep shearing contractor. The farmer is us if we have our own, if we're selling from our own stores, we're like the farmer. The sheep shearing contractor is selling on the retailers. So at shearing time, the farmer calls a sheep shearing contractor and says, I'm going to employ you, I'm going to pay you to go, not employ, pay you to go and find me a team of shearers. And so the contractor trots off and gets this team. That's like us getting editors, cover designers and things like that. But the farmer is the one who has all the responsibility of the day-to-day running of the farm. The farmer has to buy the sheep, sell the sheep, deal with the wool buyers and so on, they have all the responsibilities of the whole business, whereas the contractor only does one narrow niche and their methods are different. And to me, that's the analogy of selling direct and selling on the retailers. It's not just a matter of putting some buy buttons on a website and getting a little bit of extra income. It's quite easy 
when you have an e-commerce business for that to replace your retail income. It's very easy. Really? Even Absolutely. with such low low value items as like ebooks. Uh-huh. Like- You've hit the nail on the head. That's exactly what it is. There's two parts to that. Remind me about cross sales if I forget. Now, this is what happens. If you go and look at, say, an Amazon book page, what do you see on it? You see the main person's book and then 40 other books maybe or more. The money is in the upsell and the cross-sell. The money is not in the product. Now, I remember when my kids were little, I'd take them to Macca's. We call McDonald's Macca's in Australia. Macca's is what it's in our house. (laughs) Oh, is it? (laughs) (laughs) Well, the ice cream cones were 30 cents. Do you think I ever got out there after with spending 90 cents? No. I'd have, you know, do you want fries with that? Do you want a Big Mac meal? Do you want a sundae? Do you want a flake in your eyes? Yeah, went on and on. And that's the money is in the cross-sell and the upsell. And that's why they had the 30-cent cones. When someone goes to Amazon, a, say a customer goes and looks at this person's readers, this author's book on Amazon, Amazon then has that customers details they continue to sell to that customer anyone who's ever had an amazon affiliate account will know the whole all those things that people will buy after looking at a book and that's where the money is amazon doesn't make money out of books as such it makes money out of the cross sells and the upsells you know the frequently bought together and now there would you like the whole series with this and that's where the money is someone might and this is where authors Authors who sell in the retailers have no idea of a customer's buying behaviour and they, in their heads, I think they think the customer goes to a store and buys a single ebook, but most customers will go and buy a hell of a lot more than that. They might go and buy five book sets, box sets by five different authors. They might go and buy a paperback. They might buy an audio book and the author selling on the retailer wouldn't have a clue and they're thinking, oh, good, you know, I've sold 100 ebooks today. And but you can rest assured that Amazon has made a lot more than those the sales on those 100 books. And when you're selling direct, you have cross sales and upsells too. So when you're advertising to, and you should always advertise to like high ticket items, not to a single ebook, when you're doing that, you too can cross sell and upsell. And you so your average order value becomes quite high because authors think, oh, you know. $6.99 is a high price for an item. But customers don't think that at all. That is a very low price to be running a store with. So you need box sets, big box sets, upsells and cross sells. A lot of people will be happy to buy four box sets in one sitting. A customer is happy to do that. And they typically do this. One of my students had has had two libraries in recent weeks by two different libraries, but all her large prints in two different series. And one of her series, she's got like 30 or 40 books and they will just buy the whole lot. And that's quite common. They will buy multiple things when they land on your store. This is extremely common. But you see, yeah, and people who've only been selling on the retailers are blissfully unaware of this because they they don't know what the customers that they have handed to Amazon with their ads (laughs) And I think this is also the difference between, um, so like my website store is just like a WooCommerce plugin. And that's probably the difference between just doing a plugin, which will just show the products and then something that's like clever, like Shopify, which will do a lot of that pro, like that auto upselling for you, whereas WooCommerce doesn't. I've been so reluctant to move because like, you know, I'm definitely in, I've had a, I've had digital sales on my website for years and years and years, but I haven't ever really pushed it. It doesn't really make a huge amount of money, but probably because I haven't been pushing because it. Because you haven't pushed yeah, it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, trust me. I'm well, I'm well aware that I should, I've read your book. I'm well aware <laughs> what I should have done. Um, but I'm just so reluctant because I know it's going to take so much time to build Shopify. And I know that really, if I want to, see those sales I probably do need to use a smarter system like like Shopify um but do you know a secret oh sorry may I interrupt really here (laughs) you don't need to everyone says how much should I upload to Shopify you could be there for 60 years uploading to Shopify 
I always say just start uploading box sets first. Start with, say, books one to three in a series, the next three books in a series if you're a fiction writer, and then the first three in another series, and then the first three or six if you've got it in another series. So you've got your one product, then on your Frequently Bought Together app, you're showing the next box set in the series plus an unrelated box set. And then at the checkout thank you page, which has a 100% open rate, you upsell, you try to upsell them something else. And you can also capture their birthday. Like, would you like a nice surprise on your birthday? And most people will put their birthday in and then they get a discount code. You've also got reviews like looks and you don't need to worry anymore about art teams or anything like that because the app automatically contacts people and asks them for a review and it will remind them. What? It, yeah, it's amazing. And then you can also offer them a discount if they do a photo review, a coupon, and then they'll buy. And on my looks dashboard, it tells me how much money the reviews have made you when people come back and review and buy. It's really, it's like automated systems. So you're not frantically killing yourself if you're someone, an author, someone who rapidly releases, you don't need to do that because your backlist will sell easily from your website. Oh, from your... Oh, you're convincing me already. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so I guess we've talked a little bit about, um, well, we, we've just sort of mentioned, and I don't, you know, this isn't a technical podcast, but um, we've mentioned Shopify and we've mentioned WooCommerce. Are there any other essential tools or software that we need to investigate or look up, um, you know, in order to be able to sell direct from our websites? Just, I would say just Shopify. If that's what someone wants to do, if they want a business that will make money and they're thinking, you know, they want to make good money out of this and not just a little bit on the side, they really do need Shopify. If someone's a complete whiz with WooCommerce, well, that's okay, but to be quite honest, it's nowhere near as good as Shopify. Mm. And what I would say is get the review app, which is Looks, and get Clavio, which is a dedicated email. It's an app that has a free plan, and people can be on it for a while before it will start to, yeah. By the time it costs them, they're already making money out of it. And okay. no one has an app, if it wasn't making the money, it would be because it's a business. Yeah. So with Shopify, like I also have courses. So can you, but the courses are hosted on like Thinkific. So can you, like, does it integrate with that kind of system as well? Or do you have to, are they separate? Like you can't link over or di redirect or anything like that? You no, know, I'm on Teachable and I keep them separate. Mm -hmm. You can do it, but I think it's messy at this stage. I, yeah, wouldn't yeah. Do it. I myself wouldn't do it at this point. Okay. I'd rather keep it separate, yeah. Yeah, Okay. What do you think are the most common mistakes authors make when trying to sell, like sell direct and how can they avoid them? It's the old mindset thing. Like when I say mindset, I don't mean doing yoga or meditations and stuff like that. I mean, the actual way you look at the business, people try to bring their retailer thinking in, which is of course understandable because that's their frame of reference. I think the main thing is everyone who sells on the retailer's is used to traffic ads on Facebook. And traffic ads are not designed to sell, they're designed to attract clickers. So people who sell in the retailers can't use sales ads. For example, if they wanted to run an ad to Amazon, they would need Amazon's pixels. Obviously, they can't get Amazon's pixels. You need your pixels to, to run sales ads. When Facebook does what you tell it to, and people who sell in the retailers often say, my Facebook ads don't work. No matter how well they optimise, the bottom line is they're optimising for people who will click on their ad, not buy. Obviously, some will buy, but Facebook does what you tell it to do. So if you say to Facebook, I'm doing a traffic ad, Facebook goes, yes, I will go out and find that person, people who will click like on that. If you say to Facebook, I'm doing a sales ad, Facebook is right, I'm going to find this person buyers. And that's the difference. Clickers, who some of them might buy, but when you do a sales ad, Facebook is finding you buyers as cheaply as possible. And you run ads in completely different ways, like you take into consideration cold audiences, warm audiences, hot audiences. And another mistake I see people say is 
I need to train people to buy from me. I need to train my dogs not to be barking all the time, but you don't need to train people, you don't need to train people to buy from you. Because if it's a cold audience, someone who's never heard from you, you can run Facebook ads, get them in. If they're warm and hot audiences, they'd be people on your newsletter list, on your Facebook page, they're already warm or hot, meaning they know about you, they might have bought from you. So you don't they're the ones, if anything, that you have to tell about your store and give them a coupon code, tell them why it's a good idea to buy from you. But it's only that very small audience of all the millions of people out there who are likely to buy from you once they know you exist. And that's a, a very narrow way to look at things. And another thing is too, people always say, I can't compete with Amazon. Who can compete with Amazon? If you look at all the like so many eight-figure businesses out there have the exact same products that are on Amazon at the exact same price, but they've got two-week shipping, whereas Amazon has Prime. They're in business making eight figures from their store. They're not sitting huddled under at their dining table, crying into their soup, saying, I can't compete, woe, woe is me, I can't compete with Amazon. I always say, forget Amazon. Do not price lower than Amazon. People are happy to pay. The trouble is, our context as authors is we think, oh, five ninety nine, gee, that's a big price for an ebook. How am I ever going to get anyone to buy a box set for twelve ninety nine? Buyers don't share those thoughts. That's our own context because we're producing them, and that's our own context. Buyers out there are happy to buy three box sets at once, a whole series of paperbacks at once. That is normal buying behaviour. So I think just realizing every time someone who wants to sell direct and hasn't yet I think makes an assumption, I would advise to think, is this my selling on the retailer's assumption or is there maybe some evidence to support what I'm thinking or is it just wrongful thinking because of my context? Are there other ways? So like are you doing Facebook ads for your fiction and nonfiction stores? Yes. Are there are there other ways to drive traffic I suppose other than Facebook so the reason that I um ask that is because one of my genres doesn't seem to receive very nice comments on Facebook like a lot of kind of homophobia a lot of like so I write uh, LGBT fiction and like advertising that on Facebook can be quite difficult regardless so like you know are there other ways to drive traffic other than just Facebook or is Facebook kind of the the holy grail of uh, sales ads for direct stores there are plenty of ways but it is by far the best and also do you in your list do you disable comments that say homophobic things do you have a list I yep. so I okay. haven't tried because I've been put off by quite a number of sort of fellow authors who've tried and just said it's not worth it. So okay. I, I haven't. Yeah, but uh, it's something that I like also because I only started this name in February. So to be honest, until I've got three or four books, I'm probably not going to yeah. to do it anyway. Um, but it it the nonfiction is where I because I've got enough books to do that with the nonfiction, um, which is easier to advertise on Facebook. Um, See. Oh, so I was going to say it's easy, like on Facebook, you can go into the settings and you can put all the words in there that if someone says they'll be immediately hidden, then you can come back and moderate them. So, ah, you, you know, okay. yeah, because people will say, you know, all sorts of things you don't want them to say. So you just put those words in there and then you don't have to worry. Um, and also with emojis as well, like the angry face, there's lots of things you can do so they won't show up first and you've got a chance uh like I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, most things happen in the Northern Hemisphere. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm having to deal with all this. So there are things you can do so only good emojis show while you're asleep and you can wake up and deal with them, things like that. And you have a big list. But I would encourage you to do Facebook ads on that. But you see, that will reach your cold audiences. Social media is for warm and hot audiences because mm -hmm. clearly they've heard of you. If they're on your socials, they've heard of you. And the money is in the big, the people who make the most money are the people who can target the most cold audiences. 
So what, at what point, like, so let's, so let's talk about Ruby Rogue. So Ruby released her first book in February, book two is coming in June, book three hopefully will be before the fall. At what point, I know like one of my questions is like, when, when do we start doing this? And I know I'm pretty sure in your book, you've said as early as, as possible, but like, yeah. at, at, at when does it become financially viable to do it? How many books do you need? Like what kind of a backlist? Cause obviously backlist is king in terms of like the upsell. Um, so yeah. When do you recommend that, that we, we do this? Well, I'd say, as I said there with, you've got probably need a few. So you'd have. The first, you'd need three book box set to advertise that, the first three books in a series, and then you'd need two other items at least around the worth of $12.99 each, whatever they could be. So they could be combos of whatever, and then you need a fourth around that value as well. So you'd need four products that were sitting around the $12.99 value. You advertise to the first one, and then people you have the next two on your frequently bought together and a lot of people will pick that up and then even if they don't when they get to your checkout page there's another one they can pick up there as well so that gives you so do you when you say 12.99 you don't mean a paperback you mean like a digital product worth 12.99 yeah because you'd want a decent profit if yeah. you, or you could bundle some paperbacks or you could bundle some audio books so you're making around twelve dollars profit, okay, ish, just okay. roughly ten twelve, and that would give you a good start. And worry, upload your single books later, but get the bundles. Always bundle. You know, you could have a paperback, an ebook, and a an audio book. And in the case of nonfiction, you know, a spiral bound workbook. Throw as many things as you can. Bundles are the way to go, and the bigger the bundle, the better. Just keep bundling everything. Think multiple comes out in ebook, you know, paperback, hardcover, large print, dyslexia friendly, everything yeah. you can. Do. So I think that that would be easy enough for the nonfiction because I've got five textbooks, four workbooks. I've got digital box sets for three of them. I could digital box set another one, um, and already there, I don't even know how many products that is. Nine. 13, 14 products. That's just digital without the paperbacks. And I yeah. think I've got one hardback for, for the um nonfiction. Okay, so probably at least another year, I would say, before the fiction, because it's just it's not, yeah, it's gonna be another year because there's not enough products. Um yeah. okay. So what about um let's so you've mentioned social media there. Like let's talk about social media. Like, do you talk about the fact that you have a direct store? Do you is that where you point people? Like what role does social media play at all in in helping you with your direct um store and either yeah, yeah, what role does it play? You direct everyone to your to your store. You have your links to your store, even on your Facebook personal page where you might have all your friends and unrelatives and whatever. <laughs> you have them even have your header pointing to your store and then you'd put your URL at the bottom or even say click here. And, of course, it's not clickable, but if they click, it takes them to the description. So you put your URL there and the description. So everything on social media should point to your store. You're always pointing, pointing, pointing. And Shopify has something like Linktree that you can put on your socials as well and you can tag your products. It is going under a little bit of a change at the moment, but with Insta, you can have your free Facebook shop, your free Google shop. Pinterest is very good. It will push, once you download the Pinterest app to Shopify, it will push, once they approve you, they push all your products across. So someone can just click on that and then directly buy from you. Yeah, I've been wondering how to do that. I've seen a, a few people have like products on there and I'm like, how do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Shopify is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <Aww. laughs> I think I'm going to yeah, I'm gonna have to do it for nonfiction at least. <sighs> um, okay. 
how do you how do you set pricing for your books when selling directly like how does it compare to pricing on other platforms do you do any fun things to encourage sales you've mentioned box sets do you give a discount for the box sets do you uh-huh. like what what kind of pricing strategies do you do well price the same as the retailers and i don't have any box sets on amazon because you know the whole 999 rule but i have them wide and you can put like Six book, six, it's a tongue twister, isn't it? Six, I haven't been drinking. Six book box, I can't even say it. <laughs> you know what books, I mean? Six book box set. Yeah. Oh my goodness me, that is hard. It is hard. And nine book box sets and even 12 book box sets. I've got like, yeah, if you've got 40 books out there, just stick them all together in a box set and charge you a few hundred bucks. People do buy these things. You'd, not many people, but they will buy them. And gosh, now I was so like caught up in that tongue twister, I forgot the original question. <laughs> it was just just a question really about pricing and any oh, strategies no. to like encourage sales. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, this is the thing. When you're selling on the retailers, you'll have a lead magnet where you give something away for free. And, you know, you might have a subscriber thing on your website, but when you're selling direct, the norm is to do a subscriber pop-up offering a coupon, say 10%, 15% off, and you can do it for both email and SMS if you like. And SMS converts a lot better than email. So obviously you're not going to tell them that your dog ran down the street and you fell face first into the mud or anything like you do in your newsletter email. But when you're doing SMS email, it's just basically your name or the name of your store and then coupon code for such and such a product and it's shortened and you send that and that's very effective. So you do a coupon. So when you have an e-commerce business, you're offering a discount code. When you're selling on the retailers, you're offering a free product as a lead magnet and then the two main differences there. Okay. Um, and in terms of like knowing what to price, let's say you've got um, 40 books in a series and you're doing a 40 book digital box set. Do you price this? Do you like if they're all four ninety nine? I have let's just say they're all a pound because I don't know how to do the math. Yeah, let's say they're all a pound, so it's 40 (laughs) pounds to buy. Do you just price it at the same price as buying them all individually or do you discount slightly because they're buying multiples? Yeah, like I I typically, I suppose it's each woman for herself, but I price my box set slightly lower. So if it's a three-book box set, I'll cut a bit off. Um, And if it's a six-book, six book box set I'll cut a bit off and so on so if it's a 40 book box set I would do that like at a discount as well but also when you're doing the frequently bought together or whatever app you use for that on the bottom of your product pages their AI can do that or you can do manual which is usually much better and you can also offer a discount there as well just a little discount because 10 percent on a $6 $6 ebook mightn't sound much, but people love any discount and they'll take it up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's talk about print then. Um, yep. I funnily enough live in the same city as Book Vault. So oh, you yeah, I'm me. only like oh. a, a couple of miles away from them. So I went oh, and visited. Yeah. Oh no, oh, no, I'm so envious. Yeah, sorry. I actually went and visited their big warehouse yeah. and saw their whole printing factory. It's incredible. Yes. Um, and one of the things that I want to do um over the next year is to be more independent. Um mm-hmm. and to and so part of that is to move to Book Vault. Well, I know we still need to use Ingram because they do, you know, more worldwide stuff, but um move to Book Vault and um uh, uh, do better with the selling direct and look at shopify and tiktok shop as well um and kind of all do this all at once um but one of the things that i have wondered is around signed copies so whilst that might not be something that people want particularly for the non-fiction i have already been asked questions about signed copies for fiction so i just wondered um could you talk about print what does print look like from 
like your direct store, are there ways and means of doing signed things or do you find it's better just to do standard print books that get shipped and fulfilled from Book Vault rather than you having to do stock? Yeah, I just, I don't fulfill, but I'm in Australia and if I have to send anything out of Australia, it's like an arm and a leg. It's ridiculous, the prices here to ship. So, and I don't like to be running to the post office. I just like everything on an automated system so I don't have to be a maniac because I spent too long trying to get a book out a month until I nearly went mad and couldn't do anything. And I think, where did those years go? All I was doing was, you know, getting a book out, getting a book out like a crazy person. And it's just not sustainable. Are there there mechanisms to do it? So like if on your Shopify, obviously you integrate with Book Vault and they will do like standard shipping of print books. Is there a way on Shopify to also hold products that you have in stock here, like in your own home? Absolutely. Ah. You can if you want. I just personally don't like to do that. But of course you can, yes, because most Shopify stores are physical products that they're doing the fulfilling for or using a warehouse for. So ah. yeah, absolutely can, yeah. Ah, yeah, and okay. a lot of people do send signed copies as well. Ah, okay. Okay, I didn't, that's interesting. And so for you, the best kind of integration for print is shop, uh, is Book Vault and not Ingram in terms of like, are there other, I think there's an other stores called, is it Lulu? I want to say Lulu. Lulu Direct. Yes, I used to lo- use Lulu Direct before Book Vault came on the scene and I found typically the quality is excellent, really good quality. But the thing I found was at times of the year, like August, they would be extremely slow and they would take weeks and weeks and weeks to deliver. And they said at certain times, and then they they have typically a lot of glitches. I found at any rate, and students of mine back then found there were lots of glitches. And when you'd report the glitches, they would typically respond by saying, just have to keep checking with every order to make sure this glitch isn't happening. You think, well, who's got time for that? So it wasn't very good. And also the thing is that they're probably two or three times the printing cost of book fault. Yeah, okay. That's very off-putting when you're running a business to pay so much. Especially with all the print increases. I saw KDP put out their notice this week that print prices are going up. So um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fat. In fact, I have a call with book vault in two hours <laughs> because I'm like, how do I move 20 plus books to you? Like, <laughs> oh, I'm so envious. <laughs> oh, yeah, I um, see it's just an excuse for you to come to the UK again. <laughs> oh, I'd love to. <laughs> okay, what advice would you give to authors who are a little bit nervous or a bit hesitant either about like the workload or about finding ways to draw readers to their site? Um, in, in order to sell direct, like what, how, how can you give confidence to listeners that they should be doing this? I would say it's not like selling on the retailers where you might think, Am I, I'm going to do a new series and I'm going to set it somewhere different and what if it doesn't sell? And you don't know if it's going to sell and you're concerned. But when you're selling on the retailers, it's not, you're taking all that guesswork out of it. I mean, sorry, when you're selling from your own store, you just need good products and good marketing and there's no secret source. You don't need a special system. You don't need to do anything clever. It's just like flat pack furniture, good flat pack furniture, not the dodgy sort that I've had, you know, where nothing meets up, but like good flat pack furniture where you just follow simple instructions that say, do this, do that, the next page, do this. That's all you have to do. You follow decent instructions and it's there. I am so mathematically challenged. Both my sons live in other states and they have daylight savings and I don't. And I cannot for the life of me figure out the time in their state. I don't know what an hour behind. I can't figure it out. I am the worst, most mathematically challenged person. Someone told me once I was diagnosed with dyscalculia or something. I don't even know what that is, but I probably have it. But um, I'm hopeless, but I can do it. You know, I can do follow all these instructions. I'm not very good at flat pack furniture. I have to get my daughter. I'm She's the brains and I'm the brawn. She says, hit this with a hammer, mum, you know, put this thing in here. And I'm fine with that, but I couldn't do it myself. But I can do Shopify. I'm fine with it. It's 
if you just follow the instructions and do just one little thing at a time. So I say to authors, think of when you uploaded to a wide retailer for the first time. It was well, it was for me, it was daunting. I started out with Create Space and when Kindle came on the scene, I was afraid for a few months to upload to Kindle because I, I just thought, oh no, I can't do that. And then when I did, I thought, oh, that was easy. And with Smashwords, I thought, oh no, I've heard all about the meat grinder. When Smashwords first came on the scene, oh, I can't do that. And it was fine. And it's just, it's, I think it's like dentists. It's the thought of it that's worse than the actual. It's just the thought of it. Yeah, and I think it's that first time because the first time yeah. you're having to learn the process and the system, but every book that you publish gets easier and more automated. It's like driving. Now, you know, having driven for God knows how many decades, I don't know how I drive. I just drive, you know. And and But actually, when you first are learning, it's horrifically painful to try and remember all the things, all the mirror checks, all the indications and, and all the rest of it. So, so yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so for authors who have previously been retailer focused, um, do you have some like fun marketing ideas or mindset shifts uh, for them to help encourage them to talk to readers about buying direct? Well, rem- I would say, first of all, think that their current readers are their warm or hot audience. And bear in mind, there's a cold audience out there. And try to see them as two separate things. So if they're when they address their own readers, they can just say, you know what, now I've got my own story and just chat to them and tell them. I mean, authors are good at stories and being creative. Just tell them your reasons, et cetera, because readers, as you know, they're so supportive, aren't they? And then they'll want to look at your store. It's quite easy to get your current people to buy from your store. There'll be some that never will, but when you explain to them, you know, you can, because I always use Book Funnel, of course, for digital and ebook delivery and support. And when you explain, like I had one reader, at the, I think it was at the beginning of the year, say, and another one last year too, her account had been closed by one of the bigger retailers and she had no idea why. And she'd lost all the books well, from her Kindle. She'd lost all the books from her Kindle. And I said to her, you know, well, I gave her the ones that she'd had of mine that went missing. And I said, these will be safe forever in your book thought library. You don't need to worry about that. So, and this sort of thing, I think, is probably happening a bit more and more. So, yeah, so just explain to your hot and warm audiences that they can go to your store and the ones that will keep buying on the retail as well, but you'll get some others to your store as well. And then you've got all these people who've never heard of you that will buy from you once they hear from you. Okay, and sort of my last main question then is around the higher priced items. Are there other things authors should be doing or or are box sets the main high priced items that we can that we can sell? Well, authors can sell merch as well if they want, but I would caution on that that say someone gets a coffee mug that's broken and even though it would get be replaced, et cetera, that could leave them with a negative impact. And then if they want to buy a print book and say a coffee mug or a t-shirt, they'd be coming, if you're using POD, it will be coming from two different places with two different shippings and things like that. But I think authors can also have other products if they like, think of something relevant to their genre. There's always like products that are relevant to the genre that they might be able to sell as well. But really it's um, print books sell very well. That's another thing too. Authors are always say to me, I never sell any paperbacks on the retailers. I say, have you ever advertised them? No. You know, <laughs> like you said before, but when they're on your shop, when they're on your store, there's a huge market out there for print books, huge market for print books. So I'd say print books and even print book bundles and Book Vault can shrink wrap, you know, a few books together if you ask them to do that for you and you can sell bundles through Book Vault, print bundles. Okay. All right. Amazing. What are some resources we should be using to learn how to do this? <laughs> well, I do have my book, Stop Making Others Rich, and I have a couple of courses. I've got my main course, which is Authors Selling on Shopify, 
which is a bundle course. So it has a big module on Facebook ads, which I always say are nothing like selling on the retailer ads, a huge module on Klaviyo. And it also has another course that I've just separated from that course, Simply Shopify Pro, that goes through absolutely everything. And some people say to me, oh, I don't I don't need to do a course because my I'm already selling from my Shopify store. Here's my URL. And I'll look and I'll go, oh, goodness me. <laughs> That's that's a Shopify store, yes, but <laughs> you know it's a bit of a shock. So <laughs> yes, um, but you can find it. I've got everything on my on that website, authorsellingdirect.com. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, and of course, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. <laughs> So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. Oh, gosh. Well, I was brought up in a religious cult <laughs> and we weren't allowed to read books except ones that you know, we were allowed to read. So when I was a little child, I'd get books from the school library and smuggle them home and read them under my covers late at night, which sounds so tame and boring. But when you're in a religious cult, that was a very daring thing very daring thing to do and I used to ride a pony owned by a neighbour mum wouldn't let me have a horse and this pony bucked everyone off but I, he didn't buck me off so I was allowed to ride him the owner wanted me to ride him and my mother was very posh and had all these like lovely antiques and the house was super super like polished floors and I had a terrible argument with the one day which was very brave for me because you weren't allowed to speak up at all it was very bad and so when she was not at home, I took the horse in the house. <laughs> and <of> course. <laughs> oh, my God, I love this story. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. <laughs> <laughs> and that was very daring. <laughs> did, it, did it did it like knock everything off the shelves? Or? No, no, it didn't do a thing. Oh, and it was, I was yeah. I mean, I was leading him around. I led him into the kitchen. I led him through the living room. Then we had this room called the forbidden room that we weren't allowed to call that when people came. We had to pretend we were allowed in there. I led him through in one door and out the other door through that. He looked at himself in the mirror and squealed, and then I left him outside. <laughs> and then my mother came home that day and said, I don't know, Morgana. Next thing I know, you'll be bringing a horse in the house. <laughs> I was absolutely terrified. I thought, did she know? But she couldn't have known or I would have been in serious trouble. But she never said that before. She'd never said that before. She never said it again. So I thought she must be psychic. <laughs> she must have known. She said somehow something was not right. Oh my goodness me. That is absolutely <laughs> hilarious. You were born to be an indie author. <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. Okay. Remind everybody where they can find you, where they can find out about your books, your services, your courses, anything else that you would like to add. Well, the it's authorsellingdirect.com but I also have a Facebook group called authorsellingdirect.com which is anyone can join and my website is the same name so I've got my book and they can find my courses on my website authorsellingdirect.com which is a bit straight to the point isn't it no but um, hey that's great SEO <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. for sure <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time today. And of course, a gigantic thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Morgana Best. And this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm going to be talking to Dre Baldwin, a uh, pro basketballer come author, speaker, entrepreneur, all about how to work on your game. So join me next week for that. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review.